I think that one of the things that's worth noting, there is an Arab saying, a status quo never lasts. I think that while it does look like things are not looking very well for the Muslim Ummah, I do think a lot of that is as a result of short-termism or lack of memory on the part of the Ummah. And I think one of the greatest tragedies that happened to this Ummah was the disconnection of our memories from different areas. And I explain what I mean. First of all, it's important to remember that 80, 90 years ago, this region was under official colonization. The French were legally in Algeria. The British were legally in India. The Belgians were legally in the Congo. For all these other, it was official colonization. If you went to school, the French flag was waving over the school because the global order was that colonization was the way it was. Even after World War II, when the French were liberated from Nazi Germany, when Algerians took to the street demanding their own independence, France celebrated in Paris and massacred 30,000 in Algeria to say that freedom belongs to us, not to you. That was 80 years ago, less than a century ago. Then we entered a period of independence movements, meaning that the official colonization could no longer be maintained. It was impossible. As a result of the actions of this ummah, the resistance and the like, France could not stay in Algeria. It became impossible physically. The British in India could not stay anymore. It was impossible physically. The point here being is there was a change that led to a betterment of a situation. We entered a period of political independence somewhat, but economic dependency, where our economies were still dominated. Then we go through the period, let's fast forward now, 2010. We have the Arab Spring, a movement, that Bin Ali was toppled on the Friday in Tunisia. If you asked any Tunisian on the Thursday that Bin Ali would be toppled tomorrow, he'd have told you you're a madman. We were talking about a dialogue with Bin Ali and the power sharing arrangement on the Thursday, not about Bin Ali running away on the Friday. Hosni Mubarak and the army panicked so much, they got Mubarak to resign in order to cut their losses and then allowed free and fair elections to live to fight another day. The point here being is that official colonization, uh, semi-colonization as I like to call it then the Arab Spring if you look at it just over the past 80 years not over the past 200-300 years there's a trajectory that suggests that we're going somewhere that suggests greater independence even if we're not happy with the process of how it's developing the reason why I say that is because when you look at Bin Salman's measures or Bin Zayed's measures or when you look at Libya or Tunisia or the like the reason there is so much more aggressive repression today than before is because the people are banging on the door of freedom and suddenly the authoritarians are like, my goodness, shut this door, please, they're too close now. And if we don't shut it now, it's going to burst wide open. People are viewing the situation with one of despair without realizing that the reason they're being crushed is because the light can be seen at the end of the tunnel. And that's why I forget when it comes to Bin Salman or the like, when people look at the holy sites, I think we should flip the perspective in terms of how people are looking at it. When people complain that Macron is racist in France or the like, the reason Islam is such an issue in France is because there are more and more Muslims in France, French people converting to Islam. When Europe says that it has a Muslim problem, it's not Muslims coming from outside, it's Europeans becoming Muslims. When the Serbians attacked the Bosnians, the reason they hated the Bosnians so much was because they said, how can you who belong to me in ethnicity and blood become Muslim. That's what they are concerned about. In other words, we are having the wrong interpretation. We're looking at it as if it's a decline. Without reason, everybody else is seeing it in the ascendancy. And that's why I think that sometimes the reality is this. Wallahu ghalibun ala amri. Allah is in charge at all times of in all affairs. At no point is he out of control. The question that we all ask, should ask ourselves is, what can we do within the powers that Allah has given us in order to help to promote, in order to help to promote Islam or promote the freedom or promote the liberation of these people? When you look at Gaza in, two, in May 2021, we saw for the first time ever Israel finally lost its monopoly on the narrative on Palestine Israel. Some people said, what do you mean lost the monopoly on the narrative? Have you ever seen the New York Times publish an article saying that the US-Israeli relationship will never be the same? Have you ever seen Nicholas Kristof, the journalist, write and say, we need to realign our relationship with Israel now? Why? Because the Instagram of the Palestinians, everybody saw it. The old English woman sitting in Brighton or whatever, I said, Mike, is this what they do to the Palestinians? I never knew this. They're the ones going into, they're worshippers. Why are they beating up worshippers? That social media broke that. And that's why in 2021, Benny Gantz, the Israeli defense minister, during the bombardment of Gaza, he summoned the directors of Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram and asked them, guys, take down the wretched Palestinian content because he knew that the shift in was, was taking place. And that's why now when you talk about Palestine-Israel issue, Human Rights Watch uses the word apartheid. 
Amnesty uses the word apartheid. Apartheid is used on the Congress floor. People think these are just small gains, but they completely transform how people talk and have discourse about the issue. And that's why I think that when people look at the Arab Spring and they see the Arab Spring fail, the reality is this. Look at the discourse now taking place in Washington between non-Muslims, which is, guys, what space are we going to leave for Islam then? Because now that we've crushed who Muslims think are the most liberal of the Muslims, we are going to be encouraging extremism. So now they are revising their relationship with Islamic parties and talking about changing the attitudes to allow more room for their participation. I'm not saying that's the solution. I'm saying look how they went from trying to destroy them to talking about how to incorporate them because they, they're aware and they acknowledge that Islam is still the most potent force. So the point here is this. It is abundantly clear that Allah is preserving his religion and that it is growing day by day. When Allah says, that They enter Islam in waves. In this world today, in our currency, people are entering Islam in waves. And that's why I think that those who say that we're in decline or, we're not, or they don't see the trajectory that it's going, there are people who cannot see Allah's favor. And that's why I think that the reality is this. It's not about asking, how can I revive Islam? It's that Allah has preserved it. Give me the honor of, uh, of being the tool through which Islam is preserved and encouraged. And I will say this, don't discredit small victories. When Kilic Darulu in, in Turkey today is saying the hijab, is the head of the CHP, which banned the hijab, which repressed the Muslims, which put the scholars in prison, which asked its military to do a coup on every prime minister who attempted to Islamize Turkey. When Kilic Daraglu, that same party, is now saying things that Ataturk would turn in his grave if he heard. When he says, Turkish Muslim woman, I promise you, vote for me, I swear I will never ban hijab again. And the proof, I will put it in the constitution so no one can touch it. That shows how far Turkey, which we thought was a lost cause, has developed. And I think that's why sometimes, I think it's a lot about perspective. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, تَفَاءَلُوا خَيْرًا تَجِدُوا Be optimistic about something and you will find it. Be optimistic about Allah and you will find it. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the reasons that I always say whenever students ask and they say, what is the best book to read on politics? I tell them, read the seerah, not from the religious lens, but from a political lens. The Prophet only conquered Mecca and Medina before he died. Mecca and Medina, and he went down as the greatest politician in history by the words of Michael Hart, the historian. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did not measure success based on these things that we tend to measure success. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam measured success in that the deen would never disappear again. And that's why I think that you see these things are changing now. People say, for example, there is an adhan now in Stamford Bridge. The Muslim says, yeah, what does an adhan in Stamford Bridge, Stamford Bridge benefit me? Then read the comments of non-Muslims. Guys, and then in the middle of London in Stamford Bridge, what's going on? They see what it means, even if we Muslims don't appreciate it. In France, when suddenly they're having a debate and they're saying, guys, the Muslim Paul Pogba is the French child's hero. The Muslim N'Golo Kante is the French child's hero. The Muslim Zinedine Zidane is the French child's hero. Karim Benzema is the French child's hero. Guys, if we're not careful, our French generation, will, the new generation will forget what it means to be French and they'll be like those Africans. When they realize the impact Islam is having, and the Muslim instead turns around and says, this means nothing for me. This is a lack of appreciation of how Allah makes his religion supreme. And that's why I think that the reality is this. My grandfather was a mujahid who fought against the French, and he lived to see, he was in the mountains with his brothers. One brother was killed. He had aunties who had breasts chopped off and tortured. He had horseshoe marks, everything. But I remember one thing that he said after he finished. He, I said to him, he wasn't happy with the way Algeria was after independence, corruption and the like. But he said, listen, my generation was about securing liber liberation. Your generation is to build from there. I don't want you to go backwards and do what I did. I did my job. I did my life. And Allah will reward me based on it. Your role is to do the next stage. In other words, people always imagine that I should do something where at the end of my life, I can stand on the podium and say, I did it. Without realizing that the reason Allah made, and I'm, just probably, I'm trying to find a nice way to, to put it. The reason why Allah made sacrifice something so, is because Allah says, if you're ready to give something up for me, I will give you the benefit in the hereafter and the rest of the ummah will benefit for it later on. And that's why the question is, where do you fit within this irresistible wave of history in which Islam is still continuing? And that's why I, I tell you an interesting story. I was in Azerbaijan recently and um, I asked to go see the Zoroastrian temple. I was fascinated by the idea of a fire that never dies. And I couldn't understand how people for thousands of years, they worship fire. And this is no disrespect to, to the Zoroastrianism or the like. But they said an interesting story where an American came to Azerbaijan 
and saw the fire and he saw people worshipping it. But his reaction was not this fire is ever burning. His reaction was there's oil under this fire. The point here being is, is how he, he viewed it, the, the yes. different perspectives. Yes. And I think with Muslims sometimes we, Ibn Khaldun said that a civilization is not destroyed when it's destroyed physically. It's destroyed when it's destroyed psychologically. Allah says, وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you were to count the blessings of Allah, you'd never finish counting them. And I think the reason Allah says that in the Qur'an is so you may always remember that He's ever-present. In other words, that when you see something that looks like despair, you're able to count and say, wait a minute, Allah is here. And it's the same with politics. Because الحال لا يدوم, people think that this situation has always been there. But think about it, guys. Bin Ali fell 2010, that's only 10 years ago. Before then, we had constant changes in government movements as well, the Muslim Brotherhood, whatever you might think of them, things are moving forward. The question the Muslim should ask is not why are we in such a state, but that given things are moving, how can I amplify that wave? And that's why I think that the, 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 to answer, go back to your question, even though I diverge here, there, left, right, everywhere. But the point here being going back to your question in terms of what Muslims can do in terms of what's happening in Mecca, Medina, or do what you can. If you can speak, Martin Luther King has a lovely saying in which he said the, if you can run, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by God, keep moving. The point here being is, guys, an Instagram post makes a huge difference. If it didn't, Benny Gantz wouldn't have asked to take private posting. Facebook post, Twitter post, engaging with your charity, going to your mosque, on Eid, dressing up in a clothes that makes you look Muslims, going together in groups for Eid, prayer, for Salat. All these things make a huge difference because you might think that it's antagonistic, but somebody looking from far says, I want to be part of this. And that's what I think. And that's why I think one of the, the greatest signs of this is the greatest inspirations for me in politics, Leopold Wise, who became Muhammad Asad, the book The Road to Mecca. Alia Izzat Begovic, ethnically European. He wrote Inescapable Questions, Transform My Perspective on Diplomacy. Martin Lings, a river who wrote, in my opinion, the greatest compilation of the seerah. It's what I used to go back to when I want to analyze politics and want to see what they do because he brings so many different sources. Allah has made his religion great through the very people that right now you're looking at them, they may be non-Muslim, but tomorrow they may be the ones who inspire the revolution. And that's why personally, I'm always an optimist with this. Yes, Bin Salman is implementing de-Islamization, but I go back to the point, and I finish on this point. 90 years of secularization in Tunisia, they voted Islamist parties in free and fair elections. 90 years of secularization in Turkey, they brought Erdogan to power. Whatever problems he might have, but you cannot deny the changes that have taken place in Turkey. I remember Turkey before Erdogan, and believe me, it is so different. When a secular Turkish academic is saying, Istanbul now looks like Anatolia. What he means is, there are too many hijabis. What he means is Muslim women have found a haven in Istanbul. Or what was once called Islambul, for example. These changes, I don't think we should underrate them. We should be part of them. We should be pushing them. And I think bin Salman, the reality is Allah is ever present. I don't think he'll succeed in it. And I think that even if there are chains on this ummah, it still breathes. And I think those chains are weakening.